so thank you, Renaud. So we're, we're going to change the, the kind of presentation that we're going to do, but now it's somewhat of a moment that I have been waiting for. Um, just quickly, I, if I was going to give a title to this introduction, I would simply call it Truth. So this is what it's about. Um, Irma Boom modestly describes herself as a bookmaker, a title that speaks to her commitment to the artisanal aspects of her craft. This modest title um, is greatly understated. I would more precisely describe Irma Boom, and this is where I feel she intersects with the Bard Graduate Center and everything that Peter said this morning. I would describe her as a scholar of books, a description that I trust you will come to understand in her presentation. Now, this is the, that was part of the truth part, and here it comes. Um, if you read the recent New York Times review of Ram Koolhaas's Country House exhibition at the Guggenheim, you would know that Michael Kimmelman correctly described Irma Boom as the great, great Irma Boom. But he made a mistake. He did not tell the truth when he said that the book that she had done with Ram is an inside joke of some kind. That is absolutely not the case because it is based on Irma Boom's scholarship. It is based on the oldest book in the Vatican, which he will tell you about in a moment. And then there are other truths to tell as well. And this brings me back to our first project with Irma Boom, which she calls the Manifesto. That is a project that would not have been possible without someone else in this room. Christina Gorales. Christina Gorales pushed me. I guess people have been saying that I've been pushing them. Um, but she pushed me to meet with Sheila Hicks again, to work on Sheila Hicks, to do an exhibition on Sheila Hicks, you know, in only the way if you know Christina Gorales, the only that she can. And then she became Sheila Hicks's gallerist but only for a few short moments until Sheila Hicks' life radically changed. And then Christina Gorales was no longer Sheila Hicks's gallerist. I'll leave that up to you for your own interpretation. But then there's another aspect of this that's truth, which is a bookmaker who makes an artist's life again. And that is actually what happened with our Sheila Hicks that Irma Boom remade Sheila Hicks's career. And with that, I will introduce her to you and invite her to come here. What an introduction, Nina. Maybe it's the truth. I don't know. I don't know. There are so many truths. And if you make books, there are so many makers. There's also you uh, who worked on this book as an editor. There is, of course, Christina. There, there are so many people. And But I must say, um, so I brought to this presentation five books. Three were presented uh, this week. And uh, but I wanted to start with the Sheila Hicks book because it it, it was an interesting uh, project. I worked with Sheila to uh, when she invited me to uh, to work on a, on uh, on her book for about four or five years, and it was uh, a journey with Sheila, traveling with Sheila, eating with Sheila, uh, doing all kinds of uh, things to to get to know her, and. Um, and it was that moment when Nina uh, visited uh, Sheila Hicks' studio in Paris, where she saw a model of the book, a model of this, uh, the book I've made. And I think that was also one of the reasons that you said, I want to make that book. So you made something I worked on for four or five years. Uh, you made it happen. Um, it was not an easy task to work on this project. Uh, and I don't think that any book I'm working on is easy. I think all the books are trouble and are a struggle. 
and uh, it's also because I try to, to do something in another way. For me, the, the book and the culture of the book is so important. So I try to, to make this oldest medium, which I think is one of the, <coughs> one of the most stable mediums. Uh, I want to give it a new life. I want to, to bring it further. And if you do that, uh, uh, if you do something new, you always get a lot of uh, yeah, resistance. And I can handle that resistance until a certain moment. And uh, I must say I'm a very, very stubborn person. And even uh, I can tell Nina. <laughs> even uh, Nina fired me on the job when I was working on the Higgs book. And I, I thought it was such a joke. I thought, how can, how can somebody fire you? And I thought, I'm from the Netherlands. The Netherlands was already mentioned many times, the stale out, <laughs> to say it correctly, and winding in. Um, but um, in, in the Netherlands, we have a consensus. Uh, we have a polder uh, country. And you would always discuss uh, things. You would never invite somebody to a meeting and then tell uh, me, you're fired. <laughs> and so I, I didn't believe it. I totally didn't believe it. I thought it was a joke. So, and I was teaching at Yale, uh, also as uh, Sheila Hicks studied. And uh, so I, I thought, well, strange. But anyway, I thought I keep on working because the book had a deadline. And if you make a book, there has to be a deadline, otherwise no book. So I kept on working. And then uh, after two weeks, I got emails again from Nina. She understood that I uh, was simply continue working on the project. And, um, and also, um, yeah, how can I say that? Um, yeah, for me, it was, uh, I worked already for four, yeah, what I said, four or five years with um, Sheila on the project. So for me, it was, um, yeah, uh, I could not return and, and could leave it alone. So I didn't also believe it. And something about topography. So working with Sheila was a, was a challenge, but also super nice. And with Nina and with John Simon, the whole team. Um, and, but when, uh, when I met Sheila, I didn't know her work at all. And uh, but we immediately had a sort of click because she uh, she studied at Yale and I'm teaching already 28 years at Yale for a long time, and uh, she gave me this this text of Arthur Danto, uh, weaving as metaphor and model for political thought. So I thought, um, reading that text in the train back to to Amsterdam, I thought, well, if I make a book for Sheila, then it, the text of Danto has to be very prominent because for the um, a person who doesn't know anything about Sheila's work, they would call it uh, a carpet. And the printer I worked with, they always said, yeah, that carpet book. I said, no, it's miniatures, it's weavings, it's experiment experimental work, and it's small. Now the book on carpets. Um, so it was, it was always a confusion about this uh, whole thing. But anyway, um, when I uh, read this text carefully, I thought, I want to have this text of Danto very big in the book. And if you turn the pages, the text becomes smaller and smaller. I think I missed a page. Uh, and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So by the time you think that you have uh, read the text, you have uh, it's over. So you, you understand the work of Sheila Hicks. And I thought that was an interesting uh, idea. But uh, the, uh, I'm not sure what Nina thought about it, but it's definitely at Yale Press. They said uh, that uh, this is an academic book and uh, we don't pay anyone for the amount of text. So text has to be on one size and don't uh, and nothing else. Don't play with it, just this. And um, but then I uh, then the text I must say was a bit bigger. But then I said, is, uh, so they said, it's a text from Arthur Danto, very famous art critic. But I said, is the guy still alive? And then, uh, so I was a bit rude. I'm, I'm a little bit like you. A little bit, so <laughs> that comes to there, it's sort of fighting and a bit, hey. And, uh, <laughs> and so, uh, uh, of course, and then at that time he was still alive. So Sheila went to, um, to Arthur Danto and showed uh, my topography. And Dante said, it's the first time that my uh, taxi type said so brilliantly, so I still have the email. And so there, so there was no excuse anymore to, uh, to reject my uh, typography. So that's there. And 
another thing is that uh, the book relatively uh, is simple. It's small. Uh, if you think of all the other books for Yale and Bart, they're always very big books. But this book is relatively small because it's about miniatures. And um, and I also, uh, when, when I uh, talk to Sheila many times, she always said that the salvage of the work is very important. And for me, the edges of the book are very important. So what I did was I, I experimented for some years to find a way how to make the edges rough so that it becomes an image line with, with uh, Sheila's work. And so um, one more thing about this book. Um, if you make a book and if you make a white book where you can hardly see anything, there's a sort of embossing on the cover. So it's an, a graphic interpretation of uh, the, the work of Sheila. And I made an embossing of uh, Sheila's work with sort of weaving Sheila Hicks, Sheila Hicks, Sheila Hicks. That's, that's what this whole embossing is. But uh, the uh, publishers doesn't like uh, they don't like white books because a white book doesn't sell. But I thought, imagine if you have a work, a textile work on the cover of a book, who will pick up that book? I think only that's my opinion, 100 people who are interested in textile design. And I thought this was such an interesting project and such an interesting artist. It should be available and it should get the, the, the yeah, many people should get to know uh, her work. So I wanted to make a book which is sort of intriguing. And the moment you pick it up, you don't want to, leave, to put it down. Um, but your press said all the time, no, the, her work is so colorful, put an image on, on the cover, put an image on the cover. And I said, I cannot do it, then I simply don't hand in uh, the design. And so that went on for a while, and in the end, the book is there as it is, and, I, and now we're thinking already about the sixth edition. So, and it became my manifesto of the book. Um, um, it was the MoMA who said, uh, because when Paola pa Antonelli saw this book, she said, now we will collect your work. Uh, Sheila made a, a, a complete new uh, career, and so I think we're all benefited a lot of this cooperation. Um, I stop too long, so I will do this quickly. I work uh, a lot for the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. I also, uh, it's our national museum, the Museum of Rembrandt and Vermeer. Um, I also made a logo, and then you think it's a very simple logo, Rijksmuseum. So you would say, you would pronounce, I think, Rijks differently, because the I and the J is, uh, the, is only the sound in the Dutch language, which is an I. So Rijks Museum. Um, so that's why you cannot pronounce the steel. You also the steel. Um, so so I thought, uh, and you're all um, uh, so the, in the Rijks Museum. The, the most of the people who come there are tourists. It's eighty or ninety percent. So nobody can pronounce it. And so I thought I want to make a sort of image of the word Rijks, which basically means a state museum, national museum. And so I put a space between Rijks and museum. For you, for the English uh, people or sp uh, English language people, it's normal to have a space between words. But in the Netherlands, in our, and in Germany, in our European countries, you put words together. So basically, the uh, Rijks museum is with no space, but I made a space. And there was a big contro controversy uh, when it came out. Um, so when the logo was uh, uh, released, um, I could not leave my house for two weeks. There was, we have a space police in the Netherlands. So they check if you, if you put words in a specific way, if, because if, if you separate them or keep them or put them together, you can have another meaning. And they said, well, if the Rijksmuseum, the National Museum, is fooling around with a space, then where is our Dutch language anymore? And so there was really, it was on the eight o'clock news. It was on every newspaper. And so the journalists were in front of my house. And I have a back door, so they didn't know. <laughs> but so, uh, and at, at some point, I thought the Rijks Museum will get it terrified by that whole idea of all these acquisitions and everybody was also people on the street they asked what do you think of the Rijks Museum logo they said oh it's bad because it has a space so people have no idea about all this they said oh yeah no it's really bad 
and at some point I thought the Reichs probably wants me to, to put it together, but uh, it didn't happen because one of the, the, the director of the Dutch uh, dictionary uh, said, well, it is good that, that we, uh, so he was on the ATW news, he said, yeah, all well, this, 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 uh, this stuff about this space. And he said, well, you have some people who try to develop a language and, and play with the language. If that hadn't, hadn't been done by Fondo, uh, or other people, then the, 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 the language would never develop. So I would say uh, we, uh, I wanted to take it in, uh, in the Dutch dictionary, even the word like space museum. Of course, it, 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 it didn't do it because it's a name. But uh, he said it's good to develop um, about the language, so it's there. But it was it was hell, I can tell you, because I always thought, what did I do wrong? And I thought, it's just to make a logo. And if you make a logo, you have uh, artistic freedom, so who cares? Um, anyway, uh, to, and I want to talk about time. All the books I show, except the Shita Hicks book, but all the books have something with time. It's all, all the books are in a hurry. And I think it's also because of new techniques uh, people think that you can make a book in a week or so, but this extremely fat book, uh, it has about uh, 800 pages, is made in two weeks. I made a show for Rembrandt at the Rijksmuseum. It's uh, 300 etchings and it's on the back, and 60 drawings and 22 uh, paintings. But when I made the exhibition, and it's all from the collection from the Rijksmuseum, there was no catalogue, and I always said to Taco Debits, the director of the museum, why don't we make a catalogue? Because it's it's your crowd, it's it's all the Rembrandts of the Rijksmuseum, and there's no catalogue for every, sorry for the word, fucking exhibition. There is a catalogue, and not for your own, the, the thing you're proud of. And then he, he sent me an email, if you can make the book in two weeks, <laughs> do it. <laughs> I worked day and night, and I, really, I still have pain in my shoulder. Uh, I worked for day and night and made a book, and it was there for two weeks. And 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 what for me is good. The, the, also, you see the cover is a bit. Uh, it's a detail of one of the etchings of Rembrandt, and I place it in blue because it, I think to make it blue, it becomes suddenly modern because Rembrandt in, in the Netherlands maybe also here. Is an artist who's brown, you associate it with brown and dark. And I thought to give him a bit more uh, yeah, contemporary uh, freedom and I make it uh, yeah, almost like a big pen, it's, uh, it's blue. And of course, um, because it was done in such a quick, uh, in quick way, nobody saw the cover, no marketing people involved got. Thank you. And uh, and the book was a bestseller. It sold out, I think, in three books. It's a three weeks. So. So I made, I'm, uh, I was last week also in uh, New York. And um, and I was maybe starting with, not with MoMA, but with Ram. So last week I was in uh also in uh, New York, I came back uh, two days ago, uh, because uh, in one week, three books I've made uh, were released or published. So it's for me a miracle in, in one week, three books, and all very different books. And if you look at all my books, they're all completely different, because I, I maybe I have a style, but if I have a style, uh, I think it's my attitude uh, towards books books. Uh, so all the books are different because uh, I think that the content of the book is for me uh, the most in, uh, important part, why the book gets, gets a certain form. Um, so this book uh, I did, uh, it's, a, it's not a catalog, we call it the book for the Guggenheim uh, Countryside Exhibition, which Remco has uh, made for, uh, yeah, I worked on for six years and I worked on this book, for, yeah, I, don't, I don't dare to say how short time. Um, but anyway, uh, this book is uh, it's on the countryside and I do a study in the Vatican Library in, in Rome and I've been there six months now and I'm continuing researching there and what I found out that the oldest book in the Vatican is on the countryside. It's a poem on the countryside, it's the Virgil and it's 500 after Christ. It's, an, uh, it's a manuscript. 
but uh, when I was uh, I researched not only manuscripts uh, and, and I'm researching basically what happened to the book because the book nowadays is such a conservative medium and I try really to keep it alive and, and, and bring it further and, and I think because it's the most stable information carrier we have I think we sh really should uh, treasure the whole book and I think the book because of the flux of internet becomes more relevant it's fixed information, it's edited information and uh, and that's why it, uh, you 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 don't make a book uh, for now, but I think you make a book for the future. And that's also what I realized working uh, in the in the Vatican Library. Um, and then another book I found in the Vatican Library was um, a book uh, from uh, Aldus Manusius uh, from 1501. It was the oldest pocket book uh, uh, printed, and Aldus Manusius uh, uh, wanted to democratize uh, the virtue. So the oldest book, the pocket book in the Vatican Library is uh, is this size. So it's, And it, the content was again virtual, so the book on the countryside. And I told Rem uh, when we were working on uh, the catalog, let's make, uh, yeah, let's uh, revert to our book, to this, to, to the first printed pocket book. And he, when I showed him the size, he said, well, that's very small. Because uh, 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 Rem and I make b fat books. We did elements of architecture, two thousand five hundred pages, and and we we work on it for for ages. And uh, yeah, and and I made an SHV free book, he a very fat book. He did SMLXL, and then I come with this idea to make a small book. He said, "Well, the content will never fit in it." So we, so it has to be. We, I uh, when I uh, the, in my study at the Vatican. I measure every book. I do a, a, an exact uh, a calculation and measurement of all the books. I, I make a description of the books because you cannot photograph in the Vatican. Basically, if you see the descriptions of the books I've studied, you can remake a book. And that's, I think, uh, a very interesting thing. And because you cannot photograph in the Vatican, I had to look more carefully than ever. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm really now a trained eye to perform. I have, do I still have time? Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. And <laughs> and uh, so uh, this book is a complete, uh, has the complete same dimensions as the, the book on Virgil in the Vatican. And I thought also it was an interesting idea that that content, uh, a that a book can make content uh, democratic. And this book uh, is small, uh, it's relatively uh, cheap. And there's an enormous print run. That's also what for me is super important that a book has a print run, because then then it makes uh, sense to make a book because it's the representation of uh, information. And um, but anyway, so when we showed it to the Guggenheim, I also had to tell the story about Virgil, about uh, about Aldus Manicius, the printer and publisher from Venice, uh, and that this was produced in 1501. And people were then convinced because basically a small book people associate with a book on yeah with a, a, a book for poems, and 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 of course I say then yeah but it is a reference to a book. Uh, to a poem, a, a very long poem, because the virtue was uh, many pages. And again, same thickness. And I also made a new typeface for this uh, for this book. And uh, if you see the book, it looks a little bit gray, but that it's because I made a typeface uh, with a reference to, uh, to a big pen. Because Rem Kohlhaas, in the book only called uh, RK, is uh, always uh, writes with a, with a red big, big pen. But my, uh, I always use a blue big pen, so I made it blue, and that's why if you look at the text, it looks a bit, uh, it looks a bit old. So it has this reference to the old uh, Virgil book. Um, and I'm continuing my research at the Vatican, uh, and uh, I will make a publication about it in maybe a couple of years. I'm not sure when. If uh, if a book has no deadline, it doesn't exist. So uh, I have to set a deadline. Uh, another book I did in a, in a relatively short time is the book for, for the Mama, for Neri Oxman, the show which opened uh, last week. And it's a book, um, uh, I must say, I didn't know uh, Neri Oxman at all. Uh, she's this, uh, the, the MIT professor who's researching to build with uh, natural uh, materials. And when I uh, read about her and looked, looked her up, 
I thought uh, the, the I, w I, I was thinking of whole earth catalog and so this it doesn't look like whole earth catalog at all but uh, but it's it is my reference I cannot make it smaller no. anyway um, and so this book is full of images and captions and uh, when I showed it to uh, Paola in, uh, and online to, to Neri, uh, and I explained my ideas that, uh, that I thought that the book should be, uh, yeah, sort of, uh, if you look at it, that you think uh, it, it has all these images and, and captions so that it's, that you can go from one image to another and that it's, it's this uh, richness of her research that you can, uh, can see. And only after these full pages, really full, very scientific images, uh, you get a sort of hero images where you can see uh, the, the beauty of, of, of the work of uh, Neri. And you can see this, she has a silkworm pavilion and in detail you can see the silkworms working like hell on making uh, a pavilion. I think there, there were 70,000 uh, silkworms uh, for the pavilion in Hautamana. To build a pavilion, but anyway, um, so uh, every book. So you see, this is also completely different. But uh, what for me is interesting when I uh, propose an idea like this to uh, to the authors, uh, they um, they said, "Okay, we like the idea." So the content is made for the book. So it's not that there was images and and text already ready. No, it it is made for this uh, for the. For the design concept, so and that works, of course, really good because then uh, a book is not uh, uh, one plus one becomes minus three, but then it becomes plus five. So it it adds to it. You help each other, and a book is a collaborative effort, and uh, and that's what I always try to do that that you work together and, and bring it to uh, yeah, to another level. Um, that's that. It's printed in Turkey, so I couldn't go to press check. Um, yeah. Uh, this book, of course, Eileen Gray. And then, if you think of a book for Eileen Gray, should it be gray or should it be yellow? Should it be blue? <laughs> and, and, and I really thought all the time, oh, I thought I should make, um, I should make a red book or I should make. Uh, I always wanted to give her color, or even I wanted to give her a name. Uh, I want to. Had her in, wanted to have her name on the edges to, to make it white, and I thought if it's on a bookshelf, you can see the name Eileen Gray very well. And then I showed a PDF to Nina, and she said, "Why is it white?" So well, I think that it works on the bookshelf. <laughs> but she said, "No, you, you, I have seen gray versions, so let's keep it gray." And then I thought, "Yeah, maybe it should be gray." And I always make these uh, tiny uh, models, and uh, and then I also thought, well. If we make a book for Eileen Gray, why not have something on the spine, uh, on the, on the edges? So I used the, the Billy Bee uh, carpet to to uh, in an abstract form, uh, so it's only in gray uh, um, on the edges, and so that's why if you see the book, um, it is uh, it has this uh, yeah this work of Eileen Gray, and what I think was interesting of hearing all the wonderful uh, talks today. That um, so it's sort of in intuitively, uh, I made the book also very in a sort of abstract form. Uh, the typography of the of the inside has all these abstract forms, and uh, so the, the the text is not uh, right flush or how do you call it, but it's all uh, justified. So it becomes sort of very uh, abstract, and even the, the captions to the images are placed in the column, so you get another form and it really relates and, and that's only what I realized uh, sitting here this morning so it really uh, um, yeah reversed to the work of Eileen Gray it has all these um, all these uh, yeah, sharp forms so and it's like her uh, like her rugs and so there was an interesting uh, finding today and further so this is the, the work which is also on show uh, at the White Graduate Center this is the the rug uh, where I revert uh, my edges to. Um, and another thing is that the, the design of the book, I, I really don't, this, Nina has word, fantastic words, but I don't consider myself as a, as a good designer, not at all. 
I'm still trying and experimenting. And, um, and, and only the content makes, uh, gives me the, 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 the inspiration for the, for the design. And um, and the way I lay out this uh, these pages uh, refers very much to the layout of the portfolios of uh, the Eileen Gray uh, book. The portfolios uh, you have seen this morning already. So it's uh, so the way I design is very intrinsic. So it is it is from from the content I uh, I start working uh, on a project. Something about color gray. I also had an idea to uh, to put the text in gray. But then I thought, imagine if people see a book with text in grey, they'll think it's badly printed. So I thought, well, let's keep it black. Let's don't fool around. Let's keep it black. But further, uh, all the references in the in the text have a sort of uh, highlight, almost if you were uh, highlighted with a marker, uh, figure numbers or something like that. So it's also to give basically a sort of classic. Uh, uh, typography with an enormous uh, column width, a sort of modern uh, character. Um, yeah, talking about time. So uh, the three books, so the the, the, um, the Eileen Gray book, the Kohas book, and the Neri Oxman book, the Mama book, they all almost killed me. I think it, I will, <laughs> I will live uh, 10 years less. Maybe that, that, that's for the, for the whole book world uh, uh, great. But I think for me, I worked like hell, and I hardly slept, uh, and I'm amazed that I'm standing here, <laughs> and that I came back to New York, uh, so flying is also not uh, the, the best uh, thing for your health. But anyway, uh, I flew back because I thought it was important to be here today uh, uh, and, and to hear all the stories and be at the opening of the, the wonderful Eileen Gray show, so all the compliments to the people here at the first row. Um, but uh, nowadays, uh, yeah, making books is people think that because it's all uh, with computers and quick presses that uh, that you can make a book quickly. But it's not true. It's it is it is a wonder that the book is here. I guess <laughs> that the, the the text and images came in on January fifteen, and the, it was handed in to the printer at February fifteen. So. Four weeks later, it's four weeks of, uh, and Nina was there as well, of no sleep and, uh, and just uh, get it done. But the funny thing is that the book gives so much energy. And if you make a book in a flow, so this is a paradox, um, that, uh, that, that uh, it, it's basically good for the book that it's, based, uh, that it's made in such a short amount of, uh, of time and that it all came together as, uh, as one. And I think that's the good about short timing. Thank you, Nina. <laughs>